When you were younger, which gaming company would you say had the biggest impact on you? Maybe you grew up with Nintendo or Sega or even ones like Valve or EA. Maybe Square Enix or Capcom. For me, it was AWE Productions Inc. Yeah, I grew used to seeing this logo whenever I'd load up a game on my computer. They weren't a big company or an especially high budget one, but they managed to work their way through a bunch of different games based on TV shows for children. Many remember them for their work on the Spongebob point-and-click games such as Employee of the Month or the PC renditions of Lights, Camera, Pants, and the movie. Even though they used a lot of the same assets from game to game, the Spongebob PC games were really enjoyable for me. Looking back at them in adulthood, I grew to respect AWE as a company. Their games never had remarkably high budgets, noteworthy graphics, or even the most coherent writing. But they were fun, and as a child, I adored almost everything they made. You can't say they didn't at least somewhat appeal to their target audience. That being said, not every game of theirs necessarily hit the mark. It's like I always say, not every game can be lights, camera, pants on the PC. What do you mean? I say that all the time. AWE went through a few weird phases of putting out games that just seemed strange or less polished than their more respected ones. The happenings at the company have been kept secret for the most part, so nobody really knows what went down behind the scenes, apart from rumors and speculation. For example, Nighty Nightmare was noticeably lower quality than the highly involved games that preceded it. Legend has it that it was rushed to completion because the company was failing and needed to make some quick sales. Operation Krabby Patty was also a strange game with unusual cutscenes and repetitive gameplay. It's unfortunate that this is probably the most widely known AWE game because it really doesn't do the company justice and people shouldn't hail it as indicative of every AWE game's quality. However, one of the stranger things to come out of AWE was an oddly fascinating game based on Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius. This came out in 2001, the same year Operation Krabby Patty came out. It drew inspiration from the movie that kicked off the show, and to say the least, it more or less represents just how bizarre AWE games were in the early 2000s. Let's take a look at it. When you start it up, you get an opening cutscene of this giant chicken ship, <laughs> that's funny to say, that aliens called the Yokians are flying through space. They're called Yokians because they look like eggs, get it? Have you located the rebel base yet? Um... <laughs> no. Is that really our main antagonist's voice? He sounds like a teenager that's trying to be scary. One that isn't really succeeding at it either. So these aliens are after Jimmy Neutron for... some reason that will never be disclosed in this game. Meanwhile, Jimmy is in his lab showing off a teleportation phone booth to Carl. Totally not at least semi-Doctor Who inspired. Oh darn. I was looking forward to eating that apple. Oh my god. Why does he look like that? Remember when I asked why Carl wasn't in Nicktoons basketball? Well, if his 3D model here is anything to go by, we might have our answer. <laughs> That's not to say Jimmy looks much better, though. I don't like criticizing animation since I know budgets and time constraints can affect things like that, but come on. This is laughable. I thought this was an AWE game, not a 3D groove one. But anyway, the phone booths act as a means of transportation to different locations in the game. I will admit, it's clever how they insert them into the story like this and give an explanation for why they're there and how they work. Maybe this is a decent game, hidden behind terrible animation. <laughs> or maybe we shouldn't get our hopes up. So the phone booth is Jimmy's science project, and he's trying to win a science fair at school. This science fair is mentioned numerous times throughout the plot, but it never really amounts to anything. You never even get to see who wins it. Yay! We've done it! It worked! Just a few more parts, then I'll be able to teleport anywhere, even to outer space! That would surely get me first place in the science fair. No, I'm not joking. That's how quickly the game hits you with the menu screen. Just look at Jimmy's eyes and see how they follow you everywhere. Remember kids, Jimmy is always watching. From the menu, you can access different screens that tell you which items you have and what inventions you can use. We'll discuss these when we get to them. Now are you ready to see how this game actually plays? I don't think you are, because I sure wasn't. As soon as you start, the gameplay will most likely look something like this. To say the controls are terrible would be the understatement of the century. 
Whether you use the mouse or the keyboard, the camera directly correlates with the direction you move in, so you can't comfortably go the way you want to move. The buttons to jump and bring up your inventions are also weird. You jump by either right-clicking or pressing shift, but you open the menu by hitting spacebar. It gets really confusing, and I had a hard time getting used to it. I kept opening my inventory on accident while trying to jump. Over time, I got used to the controls for the most part, but it took far more practice than it probably should have. You collect neutrons to fill your neutron energy, which serves as your health. You can regenerate it up to 25 in your lab, but I never ended up needing to. The game is generous with how many neutrons it gives you. You can explore the lab and see all these items that we'll get to later, but when you get to the jetpack, you'll be thrown into a practice mode where you can learn the controls for it. And I'll teach you how to use your shrink ray and jetpack inventions. To use your shrink ray, point toward the object you wish to shrink. Then press and hold the left mouse button. You will consume neutron energy each time you use the shrink ray. You must be near the- Um, any day now? To use your jetpack, press and hold the right mouse button. The jetpack consumes energy from the neutron energy meter each time it is activated. The jetpack has a maximum height level that adjusts to the ground level according to what you are flying. Is this ever going to end? Limited, so the jetpack will not overheat. The jetpack can also sense your height and will activate automatically to slow down any falls that would normally... Jeez, how complicated is this jetpack? Basically, you have a jetpack to fly and a shrink ray to shrink enemies with. The jetpack is fun to use, but it uses up your neutron energy. Why would they make a feature that makes the game more fun, but punish you for using it? It isn't really necessary for it to use up your energy either. The developers just didn't want you to enjoy yourself. Also, the jetpack controls are even harder to get used to than the walking ones. This is what it looked like when I tried to complete the practice stage. I was beginning to think this game would be impossible for me to get through. You have to give yourself time to fly higher by remaining afloat before you try to reach any high surfaces. Thankfully, the jetpack didn't give me too many problems in the actual game, just in this practice portion. I will say though, the music is really good here. Even when the graphics fail, AWE has always been praised for making some fantastic soundtracks. Back in the lab, Carl tells you that your walking fish called Darwins and girl-eating plants have gotten loose. So you have to shrink them and collect them throughout the game. Jeez, who hurt Jimmy bad enough to the point where he had to make girl-eating plants? Yes, I know they were from the show. You can also feed Goddard if you find tins and cans for him. Here boy, full dish! <laughs> Jeez, that invoked an emotion I can't even begin to explain. So you follow Carl outside so he can show you some cool neutrons he found, specifically red ones that give you even more energy than the blue ones. But before you follow him, you might want to explore the neighborhood and see all there is to see. There are many objects you can interact with if you find items that correlate with them. You can also find different foods such as a... Mmm, candy bar. <laughs> I love the way he says that. Was there any reason for him to pronounce it like that? It sounds like he's trying to get people to make a famous quote out of it. I will say though, I appreciate how many things there are to interact with. They sure loaded this game up with features. It's also fun to explore the neighborhood and fly around, especially when you visit this playground. You can even find red neutrons on your own, so why do you even need to follow Carl into Cindy's backyard where a rabid dog is waiting for you? <laughs> I had my shrink ray set on clone! Do I even need to ask why you have a cloning button on your shrink ray? This has been a cautionary tale about the dangers of multi-purpose tools. So you then get a call from this repulsive character who reminds you that you have to race against the cool kid, Nick. What's strange is that they call this character Benny, but his name in the show is Wendell. This might have been before he became a more established character, but it's still interesting to note. Hello? Hey, Neutron, it's Benny. <laughs> 
Nick, why don't you call you and see if you're ready for another race? I'm also not a really big fan of his constantly sniffling shtick. I never really understood the appeal of gross-out humor. Is it supposed to be funny? Is it just supposed to be nasty? What's the intended goal with it? Why would anyone want to be grossed out? Anyway, Nick stole your map of Area 51, which you had for reasons that will once again never be disclosed, so you have to go race him at school. First, you need to get Goddard into scooter mode. On the way back to the lab, you can sail this boat down this river. Let's see it float! <laughs> Come on, then. Okay, let's hurry along here. Are you serious? And it's all for nothing. Gotta love meaningless features that take way too long to execute. You can also explore Jimmy's house, eat the food in the kitchen, and put some collectibles in vases and stuff. Be warned, though. There's some scary stuff in here, such as this radio that makes a weird noise when you walk by it. You stay off the bed with your shoes on, young man. Mom, is that you? Where is she talking to me from? And not to mention this TV that shows a Yokian through its static. This is kind of unsettling and drastically juxtaposes the happy music and colorful setting around it. They're here. You can also play the piano by running in front of it. You can even bathe. You can do anything in this game. Why do people hate it so much? So you see a cutscene of the aliens again, then you can activate your Goddard scooter to drive around. It's annoying that you can't use a hotkey to activate it, and you have to open your inventory every time you want to turn to scooter mode, but it's worth it because driving is so much faster than walking. Though the camera always goes into a weird angle whenever you ride the scooter. Before we go race Nick, let's launch a rocket. Kind of meaningless, but cool. At school, you can chase this bus that's just kind of driving in circles. It can't even run you over. But when you go in, you can race Nick, who wants to show off his sick skateboard skills. Was a good, the bad, and the ugly reference really necessary? It's not like you're in the Wild West or anything like that. Nick also looks... really bad. Like, really bad. He's seen better days. His self-perceived coolness is compensation for the soul he lacks after his will to exist was trampled by the horrors of reality. Racing him is super easy. He doesn't go very fast, but you do have to collect every flag icon along the way. If you miss one, you have to go back for it. The game doesn't tell you this, so it's easy to keep going with the race when it won't even let you win. Be that as it may, it doesn't really matter because it's easy to complete two laps before Nick even finishes one. When you beat him, he challenges you to a rematch outside, but gives you a baseball that you can use Goddard to shoot targets with. First basketball, now baseball? Jimmy has the most sports-savvy dog in existence. Before you go, you can explore this dark and ramp-filled school to find enemies such as Jimmy's Darwins. You can shrink them and collect them to fill fish tanks in your base. When you go out for the rematch, you'll find that it's harder than the indoor one, but still kind of easy. It's easier to miss the flag since you have more space this time, but Nick is still really slow. When you win, he gives you the map of Area 51 and you can head over there to find stuff for your science project. Objectives. Go to Area 51. Why is this so funny to me? That really shouldn't be. You can use the phone booth to head to Area 51 and you'll find that it's the worst looking location in the entire game. Seriously, look at this. Jimmy must be some sort of god spawning the world around him as he goes. I like the desert location idea, but this is some lazy level design. There's so much unnecessary open space, and then there's this little bit of civilization with a single shack and a tiny bridge. There's also a crashed alien ship in front of a chasm, a vulture flying around, and a police car that arrests you if it drives into you. Nah, it just drops you off at spawn. We also get some lore here. 
Apparently the Yokians dropped a special space element in a mine, and Jimmy somehow knows about this, so he's going to retrieve it. Maybe this game could have given a little more backstory than it did, so we could better understand Jimmy's relation to these aliens. Even a wall of text at the start would have been better than absolutely nothing. I guess they just assumed kids would be playing and they wouldn't try to understand the story. But come on, I grew up with Bionicle. Don't assume kids don't care about storytelling. So I found the mine on accident after falling into the chasm, and the game drastically escalated from there. Hey, what's that noise, Goddard? Oh no, I think the Yokians have detected us! Wow, they're beating me aboard! I better get this invisibility invention ready for a live field test! Goddard, I'll be back soon! That's right, in the blink of an eye, you've been captured by the Yokians and you have to use an invisibility device to sneak out of your cell and escape the ship. Yeah, that all just happened. No build-up whatsoever. This game has the pacing of fanfictions I wrote when I was nine. So a guard opens your cell door for absolutely no reason and you have to turn invisible. How, you ask? Very good question. I have no idea what I'm doing here. That's because you have to wait for your invisibility meter to charge before you can even use the gadget. It's honestly a really annoying mechanic. I'm not sure why you have to wait for it to charge after selecting it. Why can't it just be ready to go? Once you get it to work, you run out of invisibility very quickly, so it's almost meaningless to even use this power. You barely have time to do anything before you're visible again. It's a fun feature, but not by any means a practical one. So you sneak around the ship, avoiding aliens and collecting items until you you reach the escape pods. You get a bouncing bubble gadget that you rarely ever have to use, then you escape. Not the most necessary mission, but at least it shakes things up a bit. Once you get home, you speak to your mother in front of the house. She says your dad has the key to the tool chest in the garage, so you have to go downtown to find him at the candy bar. Candy bar! Not that candy bar. This mission really only serves to introduce the downtown location. Check out how the floor moves in this cutscene. Oh god, where am I going? So you go back home with the key so you can get your mom a wrench. You can also get this device that allows you to control Goddard remotely. You can't use it yet, though. When you go back to your mom, you get an oddly hilarious cutscene. I think Libby's calling for you. It sounds like she's in trouble. Gee, I wonder what she needs help with. So you shrink the girl-eating plant and save Libby. She's awfully kind to you, considering you just unleashed Audrey 2 on her. Thanks, Jimmy! I hope that's not your science fair project. It's still not housebroken. I'm almost done! Just gathering up some last-minute parts and I'm ready to go. I know Cindy's got a part you could use. She went downtown to get some purple flurp. If you buy her some purple flurp, I'm sure she trades you for it. So you go to the candy bar to buy a purple flirt for Cindy so she'll give you a part for your science project. Jeez, her face has the same energy as a porcelain baby doll. Jimmy must have made the girl-eating plant with her in mind. So she gives you a grappling device and sends you to find Carl, who was looking for you at school. For some reason, there's now a dinosaur chasing the school bus and kids are screaming from inside the bus. You can save the day, but you have to wonder why everyone's so mean to Jimmy when he's likely saved their lives on numerous occasions. So Carl is looking for his inhaler, but you refuse to help him. Okay, now I think I know why people hate Jimmy so much. So he sends you to find Sheen because... he can help you with your science project, I guess. Really makes you wonder why Cindy didn't just send you to Sheen directly. What was the point of coming here? I guess while you're here, you can save Libby's cat for bonus points. Way to go, Goddard! You're safe now. Trust me, nothing about this Jimmy Neutron model makes me feel safe. If you want to feel even less safe, take a look at Sheen. Hey, Jimmy, I threw a computer part into a small sewer inside the subway downtown. Gee, I bet you could have used that, huh? Whoa, I don't even know what he just said. He exudes such a drastically different aura than the Sheen from the show. This one makes me uncomfortable. I don't like talking to him. Make him go away. So when you go in the sewers, you need to use Goddard in remote mode so you can find the part that Sheen lost. Is it dangerous? Wait, wait, what? What? Excuse me? Is there a chance I might never be coming back? Yep, but I really need you to locate the computer part Sheen dropped. Tell Mom and Dad I love them. Do your best to bring me home. I'll be back. Yeah, in some cutscenes, Goddard will just start talking for some reason. 
Even if you can robotically generate a voice, it's so unnecessary. It doesn't make the dialogue any better. As a matter of fact, dog noises might have made the cutscene even funnier. I'm not even sure if they're trying to sound computer generated with his voice or what. It kind of distorts at the end for no real reason. He talks in dog noises for most of the game, so why does he just randomly start talking here? Hey WE, you made the Spongebob movie Windows game. How do you explain this writing? So you send Goddard into the vents while controlling him remotely. It's a little hard to make him hover, but it's not a bad segment. But I don't think I'll ever look at Goddard the same way again after hearing his voice. Seriously, what was up with that? That's weird. So when you go back to find Sheen, Libby tells you he's at the school. Not sure why the game couldn't have just sent you to him directly, but he tells you he found a cool magnet and he'll only give it to you if you get Ultra Lord's autograph from the theme park Retroland. For context, Ultra Lord is a superhero in the Jimmy Neutron universe. Sheen is really obsessed with him. So when you go to Retroland, you may be shocked to see just how expansive this theme park is. You can find tickets laying around and use them to go on different rides for points. When you go to this guy dressed as Ultra Lord, it turns out he has Jimmy's rocket because apparently Jimmy lent it to him in a story we didn't get to see play out. Again, developers, some kind of backstory would have been nice. Once you get his autograph, you can explore. These voices in the background do not stop talking the entire time. Come on, move the line along. Get your ice cold purple oh, blue pew. Pew. Hey, Maybe you will pew. Ride the dizzy ride No here. waiting here. First come, first ride. Popcorn! Get your popcorn here! I like that you can go on the rides, but none of them are especially noteworthy. It's easy to accidentally waste tickets if you press a button too fast and skip through the instance of you going on the ride. If you go to the midway, you can play a bunch of target shooters for tickets. This is where you can finally use that baseball shooting ability. The most interesting ride might be Show Me the Mummy, which is a roller coaster you can ride for a century and a half to rank up points. Not sure why this game is so point-focused. Again, I didn't know I was playing a 3D groove game. So back at the school, Benny tells you Sheen's at your house, so you go to your house and find Libby, who tells you Sheen's downtown. So you go downtown to find Sheen. AWE, what's the point of this? Again, why not just send me to Sheen directly? Did you need the game to be a certain runtime before you could release it? Maybe you could have used that time to give us more backstory or fix the pacing. You gotta use your resources where they count. So Sheen says he found Carl's inhaler and sends you to Retroland to give it to him. There, you get an absolutely unintentionally hilarious cutscene. Well, I sure am glad he found it. Hey, I bet he could help you find that part you're looking for. Whoa. Uh, I feel kind of funny, Jim. What's happening? Oh no! The Yokians just teleported Carl! I'd better get my rocket ship back from Ultra Lord and rescue Thank Carl from that man. ship! <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just silly. They didn't even try to make that coherent. But just you wait, the best is yet to come. So we see a cutscene of the aliens being angry because they abducted the wrong person. The leader then kills the one responsible. Ouch, talk about a scrambled Yokian. Back on Earth, you go to get your rocket from Ultra Lord and... Um... Mm, I think this world has bigger issues to sort out before they worry about aliens. So you need to get plutonium from the power plant in order to fly your rocket, but your teacher Miss Fowl has a field trip pass card and Cindy has the key to Miss Fowl's classroom. You learn this last bit from Libby, who trusts this very little information you tell her about what happened to Carl. Not really. I need to get some of the power plant's plutonium for the rocket ship so I can rescue Carl. You know what? Sandy has the key to Miss Fowl's room. I think the pass cars to the power plant are in there for our field trip tomorrow. Oh, that's great. Cindy carries that key around everywhere. Here, take my ticket so you can see her. Hurry, Jimmy, your Carl's only hope. She just takes your word for it without question. By now, she's got to be used to Jimmy's shenanigans, so she just goes along with whatever he says. But it gets even better. When you go to find Cindy, you get what just might be the funniest cutscene in video game history. Read my lip. N. O. No. Cindy, it's great to hear that you've mastered your spelling words, but I need to rescue Carl from space. My therapist warned me about you, Jimmy. There are no such things as aliens. Oh no! Women. I don't even know what to say about that. It speaks for itself. Women. 
So they only captured Cindy as leverage for Jimmy, but Jimmy was literally right there in front of them and they beamed up the wrong person. The writers could have used this for comedic value. Maybe they were aiming for Jimmy and missed. Not sure why they didn't take advantage of such an easy joke to make. So you somehow managed to get the key from Cindy before her abduction, so you head back to the school and search around everywhere until you find the right classroom. I also launched a rocket on the roof and got a cutscene where the aliens reacted to it. I honestly didn't expect that. So when you get the field trip card, you head to the power plant and meet Miss Fowl. Thanks for saving me, Jimmy! Am I glad to see you! The Yokians are draining energy from the power plant, causing it to overheat! We need to turn it off before something bad happens! Don't worry, Miss Fowl. There are plenty of technicians in there. I'm sure they have things under control. They've all been abducted by the Yokians. Jimmy, you are our only hope! Are you serious? AWE, just stop. This is too much for me to handle. I never thought I'd laugh so hard at the sight of my friends being abducted by aliens. This is definite Operation Krabby Patty energy. So when you go inside, you get a really intense mission unlike anything else in the game. Goddard talks again, which is fine I guess, but you have to flip a series of power switches because aliens are draining energy from the plant and causing it to overheat. Since rocket fumes can't combine with the toxic chemicals in the plant, you can only use your baseball shooter and grappling hook to navigate this obstacle course layout and turn off all the switches. You can also use the bubble, but it's a little unpredictable and the grapple is better anyway. You have 15 minutes to reach the control room, which is more than enough time, but this is kind of baffling to me. I sure hope the aliens are the ones responsible for all these chemical spills, because if a regular day at the office looks anything like this, we have some serious workplace hazards on our hands. Don't work in Retroville. Some switches are protected by giant fans that blow you away, so you have to use your baseballs to shoot the off switches to turn the fans off. You can also shoot the switches themselves, which is a nice feature. The stage is actually really interesting and kind of fun to play through. It's a pain when you fall and have to do whole portions of it all over again, but it's fine for the most part. The grapple is surprisingly fun to use. It's a shame the game doesn't give you more opportunities to use it. So once you get the plutonium, you have to go back to Area 51 to reach the alien ship. I've got to teleport to Area 51 to rescue Carl. Okay, just forget about Cindy and your teacher then. When you get to Area 51, you can actually fly around in your rocket, which is a lot of fun even though it's easy to crash into everything. Where did you learn to fly? Let's go into space! Seriously? It is my opinion that you should be allowed to fly into space in this game. Just my honest input on the situation. So once you fly into the alien base that isn't hidden whatsoever, you go through this obstacle course to reach a secret hideout. This is where the game becomes a space shooter of sorts. You have to avoid lasers that fire at you and rocks that fall on you. Unfortunately, your ship is extremely slow, so this isn't as enjoyable as it should be, but it's not a bad segment. You can even leave your ship in the middle of it. Once you reach the base, you get to shrink the Yokians and work your way to Carl. Hey look, Goddard! There's Carl! It looks like the Yokians are taking him away! Hey, that bathroom was dirty, and it was out of paper towels. Mom doesn't like it when I don't wash properly. So, uh, are, are there any peanuts on this flight? I sort of hope not, because if I even breathe peanut dust, I go into anaphylactic shock. <laughs> so are you communicating telepathically, or is the room just extremely echoey? So you get another rocket segment that's a little harder than the last one, and it goes on for quite some time. But when you reach the chicken ship, you're ready to save the day. The aliens beam you aboard, and Jimmy tells you to use his invisibility gadget, but you don't really have to. This game is almost over, but I have a feeling this will be the toughest area yet. Random fourth wall break, hooray! So this time, navigating the alien base is a lot less straightforward and there are buttons you have to press to lower obstacles that lie ahead. It's actually kind of intense to fight through. So once you reach the Commander Yoki and you can prepare yourself for one unforgettable boss fight. After this long stretch to reach him, you're in for one wild showdown. Everything's on the line, so be ready to give it your all. Well, well, well. If it's not my favorite little man. Release my people! Sure. Right away. Wow, that was easy. 
guards. Take him away. Intruder alert. Intruder alert. What are you pointing at me? Help! Mama! Mama! Okay, I try the peaceful approach. Prepare to be scrambled! Ah. Oh. <clears throat> okay. You heard the man. Send them all back home. Let's go, everybody! Time to go home! This isn't the last time we meet, Jimmy Wait, Neutron. wait, what? What? Huh? Huh? No way. That's not the end. That can't be. It is. That's literally how Jimmy defeats the Yokians. That's the end. Just, wow. I didn't think the pacing could get any worse, but life is full of surprises, ain't it? Now check out this final cutscene. It's amazing. <laughs> Jimmy boy. Good job, Jimmy boy. <laughs> Way to go, Jimmy. Always oh, my brightest student. All right, Jimmy. <laughs> Good going, Jimmy. <laughs> I couldn't have done it better myself. I knew you could do it, Jimmy. <laughs> Good job, Jimmy. <laughs> you did okay, Neutron. Don't think this means I like you more now, Neutron. But... <laughs> okay, but honestly, did we expect anything else? This might have been the single most appropriate ending they could have given this game. So that brings us to the end of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius. So... This game is fun. When it comes to games that are bad, there are ones that are insultingly bad, and ones that are so bad they loop around to being good. I think this qualifies as the latter. It's honestly so much fun, and the hilariously awful cutscenes only add to its charm. The controls are the biggest issue I have with this. They're extremely hard to get a grasp on, and it can hinder the enjoyment of a game that could have been really amazing if the writing was a little more refined. The amount of going back and forth should have been reduced as well. It's unnecessary and really just feels like padding. I don't know what else it could be, but if runtime was a serious concern, they could have included more cutscenes that give exposition so they wouldn't have to throw everything at you as it becomes relevant to the story. If you didn't watch the movie before playing this, you would be very confused. I've seen the movie and I'm still confused. Even so, this game has its charm and I can't say I didn't enjoy myself. Sometimes happiness comes to us in the most unexpected of ways. It isn't a conventionally good game, but with how many terrible games there are out there, sometimes it's nice to see a game where the biggest offenses are fast pacing and less than spectacular graphics. Maybe it helped make this game more memorable. Not great, but I have no regrets after playing it. I'll probably play this one again. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.